Acts 4. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men who came to a, the number of men came to about five thousand. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Aeneas and the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priest's family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, "By what power or by what name?" Did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to you, to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus But seeing the man who was healed standing before them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened." For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of your father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to you, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, they placed in which the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God boldness, with boldness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story of the early church and the apostles and their boldness of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and their unwillingness to bow down and to listen to those that are, were in authority over them to stop speaking the name of Jesus, but entrusted themselves to You, Lord, knowing that it is You whom have supplied the power that they need. It is You who have raised Christ from the dead, and it is You who will continue to supply the power that this gospel may go forth. And so, Your church this morning, God, needs encouragement that she may find her place alongside thousands of others who have continued the work that we see here in Acts 4 in our day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. So we've been in the book of Acts for a few weeks, and we're at one of those moments where 
If you remember, we think about the overarching story of the book of Acts. It's definitely the Holy Spirit coming and it's the disciples in the church being formed and it's the sharing of the gospel. But there's one element that we really haven't covered yet in the book of Acts and it comes to us this week. It's when opposition comes. We're going to see a little bit this morning of what it looks like when opposition comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it's the easy sort of opposition as much as we can call being arrested and sitting in jail overnight might be easy, but as the story goes, it's going to get far more uh, treacherous. It's going to be far more intimidating and uh, consequences for those that speak the name of Jesus. But we see it here for the first time in the book of Acts. And I want us to focus on the main idea here this morning. If you're taking notes, if you don't have a worship guide, it's this. To keep boldly sharing Jesus without fear, while the Spirit works powerfully through His church. The goal for us is to do just that. That we, you and I as individuals and us collectively as a church, would keep boldly sharing Jesus without fear. As the Spirit works powerfully through His church. That's always been the way that God operates. He is working in and among and through His church as they proclaim and share the good news of Jesus Christ. He does what only He can do, and you and I do what we've been called to do. And that is our task here today. If you remember from our story, or maybe you're catching up with us this week and you haven't been with us, Peter and John, the apostles, have just healed a man in the name of Jesus, and they've been proclaiming the forgiveness of sins and the refreshment of all, and the coming restoration of all things through the repentance and faith in faith in Jesus Christ. And this has been going on in our story for a little while, and now we come to a moment in which the authorities, those that are in charge, begin to recognize that there's something going on. And that's where we pick up our story. Really, our story can be broken up into two parts. It would be Peter and John before the council, and then the church praying for boldness. And so let's look at what happens to Peter and John again as we read here earlier, these first 22 verses. Peter and John were arrested by low-level management types. These are the people that are not the high authority. They're kind of the middle people who see that there's a ruckus going on in the temple, and at the end of the day, the temple's not the place for things like this to go on, and so they They see them, they hear them, they see what's going on, they arrest them, and they put them in jail. Now, there are several groups here that are there. It says that the priests were there, the captain of the temple was there, and the Sadducees. The Sadducees are the religious group that is opposed to the idea of the resurrection. Anytime someone speaks about the resurrection as coming, a hope in the resurrection, or the fact that Jesus Christ would be resurrected from His death, that they, most of them had heard about, even some of them had witnessed a few months before, they would be opposed to that. And so it's really just the disagreement, a big disagreement over religious teaching that starts us down this pathway. Not uncommon to the religious disagreements that happened in Jesus' time in His ministry when He would speak about the coming kingdom of God and the inclusion of the Gentiles and that He was God Himself, that those sorts of conversations, although they are true and they are biblical and what the Old Testament point towards, there were those that assumed or knew or believed other things that were not true and were convinced by them. And because this offended them, they moved to squash this. And so they arrest Peter and John. And it tells us in chapter 4, Luke does, that of those that had heard the word believed, about 5,000 in total. I think this number is all of those who have believed. And so the initial belief at the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell and Peter preached a sermon and people got saved and baptized, I think this 5,000 includes those 3,000 plus who have come to faith during the course of time. And remember, it just says 5,000 men. So uh, for whatever reason, they only counted men back then. But we know that this was a little bit bigger than that. And so 5,000 in total. So as you were to look at it from the perception of those in charge, this is quickly spiraling out of control. And when the church of God begins to do what the church of God's been called to do, you have seen where government figures, those in charge, those religious leaders begin to not control it. 
And how could you control it? How could, you, how could anybody, any government, any ruler, any leader in this world ever hope to control the movement of God and the expanse of His kingdom? It is a, is a futile endeavor. In verses 5-7, through seven, our group of low-level management types have been gathered by the movers and the shakers in the story. Some of these names, many of these names, are familiar to you if you've ever been in church on the week of Passion Week and Easter Sunday. These are the people directly responsible for arresting and trying and sentencing Jesus Christ to death. They are gathered in the temple with everyone else, and they, want to ha- they have some questions for them. Their questions are very similar to the questions that we looked at last week. The people wanted to know how they did this and in whose name they did this. Now the leaders want to know how did you do this and in whose name did you do these things. It's the same discussion, the same sort of thing being talked about in chapter 4 that was talked about in chapter 3. There's just a different audience. They want to know how it is that a man who spent most of his life begging for alms at the gate in the temple, is walking around and healed. This is a significant happening. This is not a garden variety miracle. This is something special. And it signifies that there's something special going on in their midst. Remember, signs and wonders and miracles were always given. They're always given to accompany the preaching of God's Word, to give a visible expression that there is a power here that is not like other powers. And that's where we come to. Peter, it says, hearing the question, and not with an attitude of pushback, but in, I think, an honest assessment to speak and preach the Word of God to everyone who's gathered. I hope you noticed that last week as, as Peter said that they acted in ignorance. There, the compassion of God is coming from a disciple of Jesus. Remember, if, if, G, if Peter was there with Jesus and these people were responsible for murdering Jesus, we would understand if Peter was a little hesitant to give, give the gospel of salvation to these people because they're the ones responsible for murdering him in the begin with. But in that story, The compassion of God is clear. And I think the compassion of God is also clear in the right preaching of God's, the the message of Jesus Christ to these people who were directly responsible for killing Jesus. This message is being preached so that everyone who hears it has an opportunity to repent. Regardless of whether or not we believe they're going to repent, regardless of whether or not we think the authority that we're speaking to is going to repent, and to believe in Jesus Christ and to change their current trajectory. It's our responsibility not to change them, but to give them an opportunity to hear Jesus and repent and believe and have the course of their life change forever. Ours is not to affect their decision making. Ours is to affect their choice of whether or not they're going to call on the name of the Lord. And Peter does just that. He repeats what he said in Acts chapter 3, by the name of Jesus, this same Jesus, the one you guys crucified, whom God raised from dead, His name has made this man well. He goes on in verse 11 to say that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Without the story of Jesus in Psalm 118 that Patsy just read, it'd be really hard to figure out who or what the psalm this is talking about. But when we look at that psalm and then we look at the story of Jesus and then we look at Peter explaining to us who exactly was the builder, who was the stone, and what has the stone become, we see that this is all according to the plan of God. These builders, these rulers of the temple, rejected Jesus Christ and His claim to be the Messiah. And they cast that stone aside, but God has taken that stone and He has made it the chief cornerstone, the cornerstone for which He will build His temple, His people. Jesus is essential and Peter is reminding them of that. The one that has been discarded has been made into the cornerstone, quoting Psalm 118 verse 22. And he goes on to say that salvation is found in no one else. There is no one else in the world that a man or a woman can be saved except through the name of Jesus Christ. And when you speak that word in this world, opposition always happens. Yes, there may be some 
that believe. But there will be others that say, how dare you disregard my faith? How dare you disregard what I grew up with? How dare you disregard another religion, another teaching, another culture? I'm not doing any of those things. I'm simply just telling you the truth. And oftentimes, the offense has blinded them to see and hear the truth that there is one name that is given in this world that a man or a woman can be saved. By focusing on all these other names, they fail to see that God in His goodness has given us one name. He could be perfectly righteous and just and have never given us one name. And we would have deserved to believe in all of the lies that we have believed as people. But He gave us one name that man or woman can be saved. Such boldness. And they could tell that they had been with Him. They could tell that these men, these unimpressive men, had been with Jesus by the boldness that they had and recognizing them. These men would have recognized these other men. They would have recognized, the rulers would have recognized Peter and John as being with Jesus. Not just in their behavior or the gospel that they're preaching, but they literally would have seen them walking in the market square. But their hands are tied because there's this great miracle. There's this guy who used to be lame who is now healed and they have nothing to do or stay with it it says that they were astonished in verses 13 and 14 and if you remember from the gospel of mark our sermon series that preceded this one how many times did we see the work of jesus bring amazement and astonishment on people that doesn't mean that it led them to belief but it does mean that there was something noticeable going on here the boldness of these uneducated men Not only uneducated men, but they're quoting the Psalms to us as they are fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah, calling us to faith. These uneducated men are telling us, the religious leaders, that we need to believe in Jesus Christ. Who are they to teach me? That's what the boldness of the Spirit of God working through His people does. It calls all to take notice and to hear and to repent. These are the same men Peter specifically, that denied Jesus. Remember, I I say this jokingly, Peter, a follower of Jesus, who was willing to chop a guy's ear off, was undone by a middle school girl. By a middle school girl. Now, i got a middle school girl in my house, and I understand the problems that Peter was facing. But at the same time, how does this Peter, who is run off from Jesus by a young lady, Stand boldly before those responsible for killing Jesus and call them to repent and believe. How is it? What has changed? We know that He has seen the resurrected Christ and He is filled with the Holy Spirit. He has seen Jesus alive and He has been filled with His Spirit. And now He operates on a whole nother level. Verses 15 through 18, they go on to say that they can't deny the miracle. But let's warn these men not to preach or teach or share this good news, this name of Jesus with anyone. Think about that for a second. They, they couldn't do anything to affect it. They couldn't do anything to mislead anybody or cause it as if it didn't happen. But they're going to lean on them as much as they can lean on them so far in the story to don't ever say His name again in the temple. They had thought that they were done with Jesus. They killed Jesus. They had Jesus killed. And now His name and miracles are continuing to go on. And so they threaten. They intimidate. It's the soft edge of persecution. You and I don't live in a country that has a hard edge of persecution. We don't, we're, we're mostly not losing our jobs because we're Christians. We're not going to lose our faith because we are Christians. We're not going to lose our homes because we're Christians. There are other people who live in the world that are that way, but we, you and I, are not operating in a world, in a, in a culture, even in Jacksonville like that. But we do still have a soft edge of persecution where We might be told by administrators in our schools or a boss at work or someone that has influence or in the city or something like, hey, you need to to tamp down all of that Jesus talk. Maybe 
you grew up in a family or growing up in a family in which your parents want you to be focused on your sports and they want you to be focused on your grades and they want you to be focused on your future and they want you to be less focused on this Jesus thing. And even in my life, when I got saved and called into ministry, I remember people saying, well, he's got religion now. That it, that it was just something I'm into. As if it was just something I was into and not a completely life change thing that happened. Those are the soft edges of persecution. Those are the soft edges in which people don't like an application of the gospel that you're teaching, an aspect of the other parts of the Bible that you're teaching, and so they want you to quiet down. That's a private faith that you can do in the privacy of your home, but not something that you need to do in the public square. It's not something you need to do out for everyone to see. And if you do that, there are going to be some consequences. And we don't see that in our text, but all of us have had a conversation before like this. Either you quiet down or else. And that's what the disciples are facing here. And I love their response to this. Verses 19 and 20. You'll have to decide whether it's right for us to listen to you or to listen to God. They already made the decision. They are not going to stop sharing the name of Jesus Christ. They are not going to stop doing the works that Jesus Christ gave them to do. They are committed to it. It'll have to be the other side. The rulers and the authorities and those that are responsible will have to figure out whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. Because they're not going to do it. And I think there's three reasons here in the text, at least as I read them and see them. And I think there's also a warning. And I'll do the warning first because it's so... It's more a like a confession time for me as a, as a pastor, uh, as a member of this church. If you want me to, to do something, the last thing you need to do is to tell me to stop doing it. Okay, that, wasn't, that hasn't worked in first grade, it hasn't worked in high school, and it doesn't work as I'm 43 years old. If you tell me not to do something, the first thing I want to do is what, what you told me not to do. All right, that's not... That's the flesh side of Ryan Hearn. That's not the spirit side of Ryan Hearn, okay? And I think that's also true of us as Americans. If you tell me not to do something that I think I have the right to do, then I'm going to do it just to show you, just to wave the flag, just to lean in a little bit to my American freedom and that dynamic. Folks, that's fun, and we all are nodding our heads because we're more like that than we care to admit. But that's not what they're doing here in the text. And so let me warn you for a moment that... The, the thing that drives us to share our faith, the thing that drives us to resist authorities that tell us to be quiet about Jesus cannot be the sake of our understanding of what we are free to do in this country. Because one day we may not be free to do these things in this country. And if that was the case of what is here in the text, then it doesn't make sense of all the people who it's not been free to believe or believe in whatever they want to believe in. Folks, we can't be driven to to bear the name of Jesus and to share the love and the, and the testimony of Jesus by simply the offense of trampled on freedoms. It has to be what's in the text here. They first, it is what happened. These men saw Jesus resurrected. All right? They saw it with their own eyes. They were able to eat a meal with Him, to talk with Him, to listen to Him, to touch Him. It was truth. Now, you and I haven't done those things, but we believe them still to be true by faith. They had sight where you and I have faith, but it is true to them. This is what they believed happened. Secondly, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the ways that you know someone's been filled with the Holy Spirit is that they testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they do it against opposition in whatever form or fashion, it presents itself. So it is what happened. It's the truth. That's why they're saying what they said. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. And third, Jesus commanded them to be His witnesses. So all three of them work together to produce a backbone in Peter and John that would not be there apart from these things being true. Jesus commanded them to be His witnesses to the end of the world. And the last time I checked, the temple in Jerusalem is a part of the world. They're on the first steps 
of this gospel going forth. And that's why they're doing it. They're not doing it because someone told them to be quiet. And they know that they don't have to be quiet. Guard your heart against responding and trying to do the work of the Lord from a fleshly heart. Because there is a spirit heart, a spiritual heart, a power from the Spirit that is far stronger than anything that you or a group of us could ever muster for ourselves. And we see that they could do nothing because people were praising God. And this man was 40 years old. He had been healed. And how will the church respond? The church will respond by praying. Praying for boldness. Look at what verse 23 says. After they shared what had happened, the church gathered to pray. And they focused first in verse 24 on God's sovereignty over the power of creation. He and He alone created heaven and earth and all that is in them. So when you're thinking about the opposition that you might face or you're tempted to be fearful of the ones that you're around, just remember who created the world. If the person you're scared of didn't create the world, then you might want to reassess what you're actually scared of and is it worth being fearful of it. It is God who created the world. Verses 25-28, through 28, it is God's sovereign power over earthly rulers and nations. They quote here Psalm 2 where it asks this question, why did the Gentiles rage and in the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. And Peter recounts for them, the church understands this, that this psalm was fulfilled in the people, the Jews and the Gentiles, against Jesus. But God, God resurrected Christ. They failed. Now, that isn't the only time that the nations rage against the Lord. We are living in the time in which nations on a sky, sliding scale will continue to rage against the Lord, to continue to rage against the anointed, and to continue to rage against His church. But one day the Lord's anointed will return and all of that pushback will cease. And they are confident in that. They could care less about the temple rulers and the power that those rulers had. They cared more about the king of the universe than these little kings in their lives. And as you go to the polls in two weeks, remember that church. We have the privilege of voting for our leadership. But on November 6th, Jesus is still Lord. No matter what. He will still reign until He returns. And there is nothing, the election of our guy or gal, or the loss of our guy and gal, that ought to dissuade Christians from believing and operating according to that. And what is the will of God in this? Now let's just look at what Luke has told us. Jesus then opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ much should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in His name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You who are witnesses of these things, and Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What is God's will? That we might proclaim. That we might share the Gospel of Jesus Christ without fear to the ends of the world. Whatever you think the other things that God wants you to do in your life, never fail to grasp and understand that there is one thing that you can be confident of. He wants you to share the Gospel of Jesus Christ with, without fear with other people. You do not have to ask that question in prayer time. You only need to pray for His Spirit to empower you. You need only to look with spiritual eyes on the people that God has brought in your area of influence to share with. You do not need to wonder if that is God's will for your life. It is God's will for life for your life. Look what it says in verses 29 and 30. He said, "Lord, look upon their threats." In other, in other words, he says, "Lord, see. Lord, 
see. How many times in the psalmist do we see that they're asking God to hear or see from where he's at and then it follows up with, God, you have seen. You have, you have heard my prayer. Lord, see these threats and look upon them and grant us to continue speaking your word with all boldness from the Holy Spirit while you stretch out your powerful hand to work powerfully among us. I know that watch ain't trying to tell me I'm supposed to be over with. I just told y'all not to tell me I'm supposed to stop because that'll just make me go a little bit longer. But it does tell us that when they prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken, meaning that it was filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the Word of God with all boldness. So God answers their prayers each and every time for boldness. He may not answer your prayers for relief from persecution, but He absolutely will answer your prayers for boldness so that His gospel and His will will come to pass and this will be spread throughout all of creation. But what is the lack of boldness but a lack of courage and conviction? What is a lack of boldness but a lack of courage and and conviction. How many times have we seen in the gospel narrative from the very beginning of the book throughout the entire book until the end of the book that there have been people of God who have been faced with this same sort of decision. Will I have fear in the Lord? Will I do what he's called me to do or will I relent? Will I let the enemy that I'm facing or the opposition that I'm experiencing, will I let that loom large in my life and God be small? Or will I let God be large and my opposition be small? This has been the story of the Scriptures throughout all time. And we see it coming to a culmination in the person of Jesus Christ. Everybody, including His own followers, didn't want Him to go through with it. But when He was faced with death, he endured the cross for you and I, for the glory of God. He did what God had called him to do because he had complete trust that the Lord would not abandon him to the grave. He would have to be in the grave, but he would not be abandoned into the grave and he would be raised three days later. And when that truth happens, it opens up a possibility for Christians, those who proclaim faith in Jesus Christ, to no longer operate according to a lack of courage or a lack of conviction, but now to operate with complete boldness. Not boldness in and of themselves because we're tough or we're strong or we're, we're committed to the cause, but because the Holy Spirit is working through us that can take a man who's scared to claim the name of Jesus to a young lady who now has complete boldness to those that killed Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who fulfills that. It is Jesus who is Lord and is the cornerstone. It is Jesus that is our firm foundation in this. If you and I lack boldness, it is only because we do not ask for it. It is not because God has not made it available to us. I wanted you to think about this in, in three ways. As we close, again, as an American, all right, I think I'm largely speaking to a room full of Americans this morning. I, I speak, I can speak about whatever I want to speak about because it's a free country. Is not the operating uh, system of a Christian. It is true, and Lord, thank you that we live in such a free country. But you and I testify to the truth of Jesus Christ because that's what he's called us to do. Because that's what the Spirit of God has empowered us to do. And that's because it's true. Not because of some lesser thing that might be available to us. Don't lean into the American part of your identity. Lean into the Christian part in that. Secondly, every day you and I are faced with opportunities to share Jesus without fear. Not because there's nothing to fear. There are plenty of things to fear. There are plenty of people to fear. But keep it in perspective. The things that you and I fear are less intimidating than the things that brothers and sisters around the world fear. They fear the loss of their things. They fear the loss of their life. They fear constant persecution. 
And so you and I fear lesser things, but they're still things. And so as we do that, keep in mind our brothers and sisters that are facing far greater things that are going to far greater lengths to share the gospel. We share Jesus without fear because we have nothing really to fear. Nothing to fear. Think about this for a second. If Jesus was raised from the grave three days later, what do you have to fear? Who among you or a group among you think that you can come up with a reason or an example that could convince the rest of us that that's worth staying quiet about the Gospel of Jesus Christ about. There is nothing. The hope that we have in Christ and the salvation that He offers is the greatest gift to our world, whether they are hostile towards it or welcoming it. And the early disciples saw that. Whatever you're experiencing, keep it in perspective. And if this is a struggle for you, thirdly, focus on this. Where does this boldness come from? Again, now some of us are bold in here because of personality or the family that we grew up in or our experiences. All right, Those things are great, and I'm sure they serve a purpose in my life. I'm not sure what that purpose serves, but they're there. But I would rather us be bold in the Lord That it is because the Spirit of God is working in us to be bold and boldly share Jesus without fear. Not because there's some other thing operating here. You're not born with this type of boldness, but you are reborn into it. It's not a personality trait or a skill for us to learn as much as it is the overflow of the Spirit of God within you. Each and every single one of us are to keep boldly sharing Jesus without fear while the Spirit works powerfully through His church. Will you bow your heads? I imagine, Lord, that there are a lot of examples right now running through our minds of things that we're scared of. People that will be disappointed in us. Bosses that will be frustrated in us. Families that may turn their back on us. Even countries that might disown us. All because of the name of Jesus. That as these various groups plot and plan against Jesus, And as the nations continue to rage against Him, we have chosen to be in His kingdom and to forsake all other allegiances. That it is His name and no other name. And it is not His name plus another name. It is the name of Jesus that is the highest in this land. In our hearts, in this church, in this country, and in this world. And God, let us not be fearful about the consequences of speaking such a truthful, plainful statement. But let us understand that this is true. This really did happen and we believe it. We see it by faith. That it is what the Spirit of God has given for us to proclaim. It is the reason we have the Spirit of God so that we can make the name of Jesus famous and share it with others without fear. And it is exactly what Jesus has called us to do in His Word, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world, to call men and women to repent and believe. There is nothing in this world that should be more intimidating than not being obedient to our Lord and Savior. And God, You love us even when we are disobedient, God. You love us even when we fail to boldly proclaim and You patiently and gently call us back to the truth. 
God, help us to keep boldly sharing Jesus without fear. As your spirit works powerfully through this church in every way, in every person, every place, in every possibility, until you return. We pray this in your name. Amen.